Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. James Brooks, Melanie Trent de Shutter Library Director, and I'm delighted to welcome you to an online lecture brought to you by the Virginia Museum of History and Culture. The VMHC acknowledges the Powhatan Confederacy and the Monacan nation that inhabited the land where our museum now stands. We seek to honor that history and to maintain thoughtful relationships with those indigenous people and all the tribes of Virginia. Their story is integral to Virginia's past, its present and its future. We also wish to acknowledge the generosity of former trustee Anne Worrell who endowed this lecture series in honor of our former president and CEO, Dr. Charles Bryan. I'd just like to make you aware of some upcoming events before we begin with tonight's show. So on February 5th at 6 p.m., join us for History Notes, an evening of history and music which will feature items from our collections, followed by music played by the Richmond Symphony. The next day, Monday 6th at 5 p.m., join us for a screening of The Black Angels, A Nurse's Story. This film tells the incredible story of 300 African-American nurses at Seaview Hospital, New York, who risked their lives to care for patients with tuberculosis at a time when there was no cure. Finally, our next in-person lecture will take place on February 16th at noon, when uh, J. Brent Morris will join us to talk about his new book, Dismal Freedom, A History of the Maroons of the Great Dismal Swamp. Tonight's lecture traces the story of civil rights hero, Reverend Curtis W. Harris. Harris was born the sixth child of an impoverished sharecropper and into desolate conditions. In time, however, Harris would come to be a significant leader in the civil rights movement, fighting against laws designed to main maintain control of the white majority over minority communities in Virginia and across the South. His story takes us from Dendron to Hopewell and then to the forefront of America's civil rights battles alongside Dr. Martin Luther King. Despite arrest, beatings, and constant discrimination, Harris persevered to combat entrenched racism and to become the first black mayor of his hometown. And here to tell us of Harris's remarkable story is William Paul Lazarus. Bill holds an MA in communication from Kent State University and an ABD in American Studies from Case Western Reserve University. He has worked as a reporter, writing countless articles for newspapers and magazines nationwide, and has published more than a dozen books on Americana, including The Sands of Time, 100 Years of Racing in Daytona Beach, The Guide to American Culture, and most recently, and the subject of tonight's talk, Virginia's civil rights hero, Curtis W. Harris Sr. Please join me in welcoming Bill Lazarus. Thank you, Dr. Brooks. It's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate the opportunity, particularly at this time in history. As many of you know, we are watching enormous amount of racism playing out on our TV screens and in the newspapers, such as the deaths of, of young men at the hands of the police. We watched in 2016 in the most racist presidential campaign in American history. And the for those who don't understand, Make America Great Again was to follow, of course, having a successful black president prior to that point. So there is nothing at this point that can be more important than learning about our uh, racial history and what we need in the future, and the, represented by Curtis Harris. What makes him even more significant is that Curtis Harris was the type of person who was not intending to get into any fights or any arguments over civil rights. He accepted the situation unhappily, but he lived with it. But when the opportunity came, he stepped up. And as Dr. Brooks noted, he was beaten, he was arrested, he spent time in marching and so on. He was, if you will, every man, a man who facing this situation chose to do something about it. And his story is worth telling, and it's worth because we want people not to forget there were individuals like this who made the society we have improve, and that's all you can hope for. A little bit of my background, there's a couple of the books I've done. I'm also a religious historian, so that's why that book is there. I want to start by talking about the birth of racism. 
when we talk about racism, we assume this is an historical thing that's existed forever. That's simply not the case. If you go back into ancient history, the Greeks, for example, saw the Ethiopians as the sunburned people, but they did not see them as somehow inferior or see it as a racial type of thing. The Romans didn't, the Sumerians didn't, the Egyptians didn't. The Egyptians fought the Nubians today, which would be Ethiopia. They had no doubt these were equal to them and serious opponents. The end result is you ask, where do we get racism from? We don't even have it in the Middle Ages. Uh, Shakespeare had a black major character in Othello. There's no racism in his play. So the question comes from, starts with the Spanish. And actually, if you think about it, actually it goes further behind that. What the reality is that the idea of killing everybody when you conquer them is not something that happens all the time. What had happened was people would be enslaved. If you lost, you became a slave. That is true in the Aztecs, that was true in the Egyptians, that was true throughout history, particularly in Africa when the tribal warfares. Many times they would have excess slaves and they would sell them to the Muslims. And many of these slaves, by the way, were Islamic. That didn't matter. They were slaves and they, they were forced into the situation. When the Spanish took over and conquered in the New World and conquered the Incas and the Aztecs, their goal was as much gold and silver as possible. To do that, they needed people to work in the mines. Well, unfortunately, the natives had a terrible habit of dying. They thought that this was not something that they wanted to do. So the only solution that the Spanish could think of was to find people who could endure in these hot conditions. That led them to Africans. The Africans were being sold already. All the Muslim, the Muslim did is continue the process by selling now to the Spanish. And the slaves were brought over to this country, uh, to, not to the United States, but to the, this part of the world, to work in Jamaica and other fields like that, other places. Well, in, in the 1600s, this country had its first settlement, 1607, first successful one, and founded in Jamestown. It was founded as an economic colony. The idea was that you would find the gold and silver that the Spanish had found and you'd become wealthy. You're already wealthy being there. It was a complete failure in that regard. In fact, until Captain John Smith took over, people weren't even working because they brought along their indentured servants who were going to do the work. So they, they didn't even want to work. He told them if they didn't work, they were going to starve to death because they wouldn't be fed. Nevertheless, they had to find something economic that would allow them to function as a colony, something they could sell back to the mother country. A man named John Rolfe came up with tobacco. Tobacco, the name tobacco comes from the pipe the Indians used to pipe. They put the plant in it and the pipe was called tobacco. Well, John Rolfe didn't know that. He thought the plant was tobacco. So it's been tobacco ever since. The plant is hard on the ground, it pulls out nutrients, it's dangerous to touch, and it requires a lot of work. And all they had was indentured servants. These indentured servants had paid their passage from England over by agreeing to work for seven years usually, but it didn't matter, but they had agreed to work a number of years in exchange for the payment of that passage. The problem is they didn't wanna work in the field either. And you really had a hard time finding people who would do this because the product was going to work. It would sell. They just needed somebody to take care of it, to, to grow it, bail it, and send it off. Their answer was to go to the Spanish and try and buy slaves. And the first slaves that arrived, first African slaves, arrived in 1619, first tobacco fields and later in cotton. These slaves were, of course, African. They were often Muslim, they were forcibly converted to Christianity, excuse me, and they were followed by others. But this raised a problem for the Virginians. How are they going to identify a slave from a non-slave? 
there were already African-Americans here, some of whom actually owned slaves. Their solution was racism. They decided that anybody with dark skin was a slave and it did not matter what that person was doing, anything else. They were now considered a slave. Virginia was the oldest and the largest of the colonies. And as a result, whatever laws were passed, and there were a whole bunch of them passed in the 1600s, in order to control the, rate, the slaves, they were adopted by other states. That included not educating people, not allowing them to marry. They got rid of the loophole that if you converted to Christianity, you were free. They got rid of that as well. Slowly narrowing down the limitations so that slaves were actually unable under any circumstances to get free. They were aided by a science that was developed in the middle of the 1800s called eugenics. Eugenics was developed by a cousin of Charles Darwin, who was so impressed with the idea of natural selection and evolution that he took it to the end. He said there must be therefore elements because they didn't understand genes yet, but they must be elements that are bad. And those bad ones need to be weeded out. And this science, by the way, pseudoscience really, lasted almost into after World War II. So it's rather a long time and it was the base. It was supported by the Rockefeller Foundation. It was supported by the Ford Foundation and others. And it helped support everything that was being done on the basis of race. Because in Europe, when Hitler took this idea, and we call it, of course, Nazism, he concluded that people like Jews and people who are disabled and people who uh, didn't fit into his definition of, quote, Aryan, unquote, were inferior. In this country, we decided it was people with dark skin, African-Americans. And those individuals often were uh, done terrible things to in the name of getting rid of the genes that obviously created inferior people. Uh, the irony is we've since discovered, after, certainly after World War II with the discovery of DNA, that we are far better off by intermingling of the genes from different parts of the world because then you don't have the weaker genes, the ones that carry diseases or whatever, exchanging with the two of the side. When two uh, people from the same group marry, they have a better chance, obviously, of having a child with the, whatever the weakness is or whatever the illness is. And we see this in groups that refuse to do anything but intermarry. And that's the process. This is what Harris was born into. He came from Dendron. Dendron is a tiny town. It still is a tiny town. Uh, the Historical Museum is open Tuesday morning from 10 to 11. I can tell you that. Uh, it was known for its lumber. It was in the middle of a huge pine forest. And for those who don't know a little bit about history, the reason that the English fought so hard to keep the American colonies is for that pine. It served as the mass of their ships. And without it, they would have had trouble finding these large masts that they needed. The, obviously the wood eventually ran out. The city lost and had nothing. People would take the train, you can see the train here on the left, would take the train into Richmond in the hopes of finding jobs or any other place they could find jobs. And that's what happened with uh, Harris's father. He tried to find a job in Richmond. He would come back on the train, hop a ride, not pay for it, of course. Unfortunately, and one day he chose not to come back. Harris was an infant at the time. He only met his father when he was 12 years old, and then the father disappeared. He has no idea what happened to him. This was not uncommon. One thing racism did is prevent uh, particularly the men from finding jobs, from being able to support their families. And there were a lot of desertions as a result of that. The family could not make a living at all in Dendron. The mother, little educated, was essentially uh, a maid. So the only way they could do it was go someplace else. So they picked up and they moved to Hopewell. Hopewell was a community that was growing. It wasn't that far away, but what it was is the home initially of DuPont, which during World War I served as a bastion for some of the types of materials needed. And after World War I, DuPont 
left and other companies came in and took their place, including Hercules. The town was segregated. Homes had been built by DuPont in order for different groups to live in. So there was a group for the black community, a group for the white community, for foreign workers. They had lots of people that were there. They did have several riots. They had uh, fights over particularly racially related type of fights, but nothing of any major significance. It was a fire. Um, Curtis remembers it as a major fire, but uh, the news clippings of the day don't give it that time of thing. This is the family home there. It was segregated, but as you can see compared to Dendron, it is a very large community. Lots of factories, lots of stuff going on. He grew up, move on, here we go. He grew up and went to uh, Carter Woodson School. Carter Woodson is the founder of Black um, History Month, among other things. At the time that Curtis went there, it was a high school. It's now a junior high school. They, everything was secondhand. And it was secondhand because of the concept of separate but equal. And the separate but equal we're going to get to in a couple minutes here. The, he had news when they had paper, for example, that they had to work, write essays on. One side already had from the white students and they had to turn over and use the other side. The desks were secondhand. He said even the curtain of their auditorium were the colors of another school that was old and given to them and they had to use it as well. He graduated from there in 11th grade. Uh, he had a, a small job, which was to a fellow who was a bootlegger and to, and to collect the bottles uh, of the bootleg. And he said he did that until the fellow died collecting a few pennies because the family didn't have any money. They had to split up. The, they eventually opened a small little store and he marries a woman named Ruth Jones. Ruth is extraordinarily important in his life. She was the one who was aggressive. She got him into Boy Scouts. And of course, she got him into the NAACP, which had started up prior to World War I and now was essentially a national organization, but very small groups around the country. Okay. And here we go. I'm going to go. He is ordained as a minister. He, had, he went briefly to university and um, was ordained. This is his church there. And he worked at the Hercules Power Company, Powder Company, where he was a janitor. This is all that he could ever hope for at being black. The opportunities were non-existent. It did not matter whether he had a college degree or not. He could not expect to be anything more than working in this situation. He joined the NAACP. He said in, in uh, Hopewell, all he did was sit around and talk. He said, if we just sat around and talked, then we knew we wouldn't be any problems. We wouldn't, nothing would happen. It wouldn't have, there wouldn't be any change in anything else. Then this, Brown versus Topeka Board of Education in 1954 give you a little background on this. The whole process had started back in the 1800s, what to do with the mixing of quote races. I should point out to you, there's no such thing as race. We all share the same DNA. So the, the race is an artificial thing based, somebody looked at somebody's color and said, you're different, or looked at somebody's facial appearance and said, oh, you're different, and came up with race. It doesn't really exist. Never, nevertheless, they came up with laws, obviously, up through the Civil War. After the Civil War and during it, actually, they passed the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment trying to end any kind of discrimination. There was, of course, Reconstruction, which supposedly was going to make it possible for the South to integrate and everything would be just fine. And, of course, the Southern states did everything they could to try and prevent that. That ended in 1876, part of the agreement with the election of Rutherford B. Hayes. Uh, this, by the way, is similar to what happened in 2020. There were several states that submitted duplicate but opposite results for the Electoral College. In doing so, if the opponent of Hayes, Samuel Tilden, had gotten one of those votes as the Democrat, he would have been elected. But a commission set up 
including eight Republicans and seven Democrats, voted, surprise, eight to seven for the Republican Hayes. One of the agreements apparently made was the end of Reconstruction, which opened the door for a lot of efforts to try and reduce any rights. Uh, one of the, the, the Democrats were the ones who were at this point, instead of the Republicans. The Republicans had been founded in, 19, in 1854 to end uh, slavery. That's, that's its main thing of ending. So it was the Democrats who were fighting against it. One of the Louisiana legislators said that uh, the Democrats would be stealing votes as long as they could find at least one vote to steal. They were going to steal it. And they did. They, they packed things. They required in tremendous rules in order to get the right to vote. You had a set. And of course, the people who were responsible for that didn't always show up or gave you ridiculous rules and so on. They, they cut into both black and white vote because you had to have uh, enough knowledge to do it. And there were a lot of, of course, poor whites who were uneducated. So it became a, rather an issue. It got to the courts through this, this fellow right here named Homer Plessy. He is the second in a trial that took place in Louisiana. In the first case, the Louisiana passed a law that if blacks and whites were traveling on trains that went through the state, that is in states between states, that they had to be separated. And the court ruled, no, they couldn't make laws for other states. So they had a law that in Louisiana, they had to be separated. That went all the way to the Supreme Court. Homer Plessy, if you look at him, looks white. He's actually 1 16th black. And he was part of a trial case. In other words, he was chosen for this, like Rosa Parks was chosen back, back in the 50s, was chosen for this, this sort of situation. And he agreed and the conductor agreed and everybody agreed and he got arrested for not going into the black section. And it went all the way to the Supreme Court. In this case in Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896 was the Supreme Court ruled that just because they were separate does not imply that somebody is inferior. And therefore, as long as they were equal, it was all right. And that became separate but equal. And as we saw with uh, Curtis, when he was in school, there was nothing equal about it. Definitely separate, but nothing equal. That includes you couldn't go in and order food at a drugstore. You couldn't do anything that a white person could do. You couldn't even walk through the same doors. Some of you who are old enough might remember the drinking fountains, blacks only, whites only, that sort of thing. And solely separate, but equal. They were not equal. Well, that's what ended in 1954. And the case is a family that had a young girl who had to walk through a train yard to get to a school that she was assigned to because she was black, as opposed to the school that was nearby. The head of the Board of Education in Topeka, Kansas, said, well, she needs to learn about discrimination. That's why this is a good thing. The court disagreed completely and said, separate but equal is wrong. Ending segregation in public schools and, of course, in everything else. Virginia fought it. One school system closed down for four years rather than allow black kids to go to school. And all of us have seen the pictures of young children trying to go to various schools surrounded by police, National Guard, or others in order to be able just to go to school, that sort of thing. And that's the end result of the ruling. In Hopewell, that led to protests. Curtis Harris had not intended to do anything, but now that he was president of the NAACP in Hopewell, people came to him to start doing things and he did not back away. One was the Hopewell News. This was the newspaper there. It doesn't exist anymore, unfortunately, because it'd been great for source material. But nevertheless, the Hopewell News had a separate black and white section. And of course, the only way you got in the white section is to commit a crime. He led a protest against it and people, for, and actually forced a change to, to integrate the newspaper. They did the same thing at drugstores. They were often beaten. They were often arrested. It did not matter. They faced off against the KKK. In one of the protests, 
uh, having to do with building something in the black community, they, which by the way, would have been a, a garbage heap. They marched. And what Curtis said, when he started, there was only a few people. But when he was told the KKK was there, he said, we're going to go, we're going to march. And they literally marched down and got people to join them as they went along, got to city hall. They were going to give a petition to the mayor. They walked in, gave the petition, came out. KKK is there. He said, we should pray. The leader of the KKK said, well, man has a right to pray. They prayed. A few minutes later, both sides left, and that was the end of it. That was literally the end of the KKK as well. They, they were not heard of again. He started going to other places like Petersburg, which is not far from Hopewell, and eventually, as you can see on your right, marching in Selma and in the southern states where Martin, Dr. Martin Luther King and Dr. Ralph Abernathy and others, T. Martin, had become prominent in leading protests against the racism. You can see him here. He had his own distinct outfit. His his uh, clothing one time got wet. He ran into a store to get something, and this is what he came out with, and he wore it ever since. And he became a leader in this particular thing, marching with Dr. King and so on. There you go. That's Reverend Harris. Of course, that's Dr. King there as well. They went on trial in Virginia and for, for not giving out information and naming people who had done things uh, in the marching thing. They, the uh, state hurt attorneys who took up the cases and so on, but, they can, but the state continued to lose. In Hopewell, he kept running for office and losing. And part of the reason was they had set it up so that the white, when you did a general election, the white had more votes, even though that was not how it should be done properly. And he actually had to go to court. They got that changed. And he was unanimously elected to council and then unanimous, not unanimous, excuse me, elected to council and then unanimously elected mayor. He said this was God's involvement because he even avowed racists voted for him because they didn't like the other candidate. And he became the first elected black mayor of Hopewell. The people in the council were afraid that he was going to be radical. He was not. His interest was in the town and making it a better place for everybody. And as a result, he became greatly honored and greatly supported in the town. The library that he was not allowed to go in the front door is now named for him. There is also various plaques and so on. He went up this is, of course, Bill Clinton when Bill Clinton was office, and he was in Washington for the speech by Dr. Martin Luther King. I have a dream speech. And that is the two of them later in age. Ruth died a couple years earlier. Uh, Reverend Harris lived into his 90s, was 93. I never had a chance to meet him. Uh, my twin brother, who lives in Richmond, knew of him and suggested the book. I was able to talk to him on the phone but only briefly because unfortunately it had a stroke and it limited his ability to speak. Uh, I was told by Mr. Shannon, who was uh, the head of the, one of the civil rights leaders today in, in Virginia. And he told me that he didn't have to speak. He would hand out sheets of paper to the reporters. He said, you know what they, they would say, you know what I'm gonna say. And he would hand out the sheets of paper. And all that Ms. Shannon said is all he had to say is that Curtis Harris was going to be there and people would be there. That completes the discussion here, this part, and I'm open to any type of comments or questions that people may have. I know they can come into the YouTube and the like. Mr. Brooks, or Dr. Brooks, excuse me. <laughs> no, you're silent, I can't hear you. There we go, that should be better yeah. now. Uh, yeah, no problem. Thank you for that interesting talk. Um, so we've got a couple of questions that have come through. Uh, the first one reads, hi, Bill. Thank you for the talk. Uh, this is a time where uh, the, the sort of pictures on TV played a really vital role and uh, radio was really common, uh, commonplace for a lot of Americans at this time. Do you, do you know if Harris was using any of those mediums to get his message across? 
he was definitely using newspapers because people mm -hmm. wrote about him. But mm -hmm. I don't believe I have not seen anything that saw that he was using radio. He was marching. That's that was his method of doing so. He would march into a drugstore with mm -hmm. people and say, we want to be served. We want to stay here. They were allowed to buy food and then they had to leave. They were not allowed mm -hmm. to stay. He stopped, got arrested for doing that, got got beaten mm -hmm. for doing that. His his son said that he couldn't believe what they were doing and his father didn't fight back. He had adopted the idea of civil disobedience and it worked. Mm -hmm. It just, unfortunately, physically, it's rather damaging. Absolutely, but he he definitely sort of went with that very direct confrontational and the very direct confrontational thing. He Absolutely. felt that was the best way to do it: get enough people on the street and march. Great, thank you. Um, another question we've got. Um, great talk. You mentioned briefly how you came to this story, but could you talk a little bit more about that? And also, could you share? Um, and maybe maybe this is incorrect, and maybe there are already biographies on um, Paris, but. How come it's taken so long for someone to look at his life in, in such detail? That's Those are good questions. Um, in my particular case, I write about American history as well as novels and other type of things. My twin brother is a reporter. He knew of Reverend Harris, but he had never written a book. Hmm. So he felt uncomfortable doing a book and called me and asked if I'd be willing to do it. And I said, only if Reverend Harris was willing to let me do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, fortunately, he had done an awful lot of tapes of his life. And they were um, at the um, William and Mary Library. This is the Them Library. So I was able to use those tapes for, for his background and so on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that that's how that began. And I did the research on my own and then sent it out to various publishers and Arcadia Press are the ones that decided it was worth yeah. doing in mm -hmm. that regard. Um, the second part of the question was, Try again. What was the second? <laughs> Why did it take so long for, oh, for someone to come to this story, do you think? Uh, was I he, think it, was I think it took a while mm -hmm. because he is not the national figure that Dr. Martin Luther King became, Dr. Mm -hmm. Abernathy and some of the others who were outspoken in the media there in the front. He mm -hmm. was one of the people at the grassroots. His main focus was Virginia. He went out for marches in Selma and, and things like that, but he did not was not well known in those places, even though, in fact, in the March of Selma, he's in the front line next to Dr. King. But the fact of the matter is that he was not as well known, but he's not alone. There are so many of these type of individuals who are on the grassroots who made an enormous mm -hmm. difference in the, in the efforts on civil rights. And I think it's just simply a matter that people just somehow got, he got passed by. He's not alone. Mm -hmm. We can think of many people through history who we find out later were very significant, but we did not find out at the time period. Absolutely. And I'm glad to be yeah. able to bring him back into the limelight. Yes, and so often we do see that in constructing those grand uh, narratives of, of any period in history, um, you know, we speak so often about the civil rights movement as to how um, women in particular are sort of sidelined in that movement. But of course, as you say, so many of those who were sort of at the local level, the regional level, um, you know, grassroots organizers and individuals like that, um, it, it can take that time before they get their, um, their recognition by historians. They are also um, extremely important, um, mm -hmm. quite honestly. The, Dr. King and others could have done wonderful work, but without that on the grassroots, it would not have been as successful as it was. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so you touched upon this very briefly, um, but one of the questions uh, concerns what kind of source material you were using. So could you describe maybe the scope of those collections at William & Mary and maybe any other collections that you were using in this research? Certainly. Um, in, in Hopewell, the library there, the regional library, uh, was very helpful in providing material. The William Mary Library, I found old newspapers. If you go online, there are lots of material. The family had set up a website, which was helpful as well. And everywhere I could find information, that's where I went. But the tapes were the biggest things that I could use. Mm -hmm. And as for the history of racism and things of that nature, that's just research through the history, the materials mm -hmm. that you, you can find uh, today, we don't go to the library as much. Just go on the internet and mm -hmm. start looking. But it helps to know what you're looking for. And Absolutely. I know what I'm looking for. 
Absolutely. So it made it a lot a lot easier then to find material. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, one of one of the other questions, because you you raised this uh, at the very beginning of your talk, um, you said that Harris was of, of course primarily raised by his mother. Um, do you have any idea of the effect of that breakup of his family at such an early age? What what effect that had on him, and did it lead him to maybe? focus on issues of family unity or welfare support or anything like that as a, as a religious figure or as an activist or as a politician? I am sure it had a great deal of effect, mm -hmm. except it was so commonplace. His family had to break up. He stayed with his two sisters. They helped raise him. Mm -hmm. They had to explain to him even how to use an indoor toilet, that sort of thing. And I think he still felt surrounded by love. I did not hear anything and anything he said that implied that that it was a hardship i think given the circumstances that he was in and so many other families were in it was probably pretty commonplace and mm -hmm. so he did not in any of his marching and everything else they were issues of that time period and that need as opposed to looking at the broader picture but when he became mayor then he's looking at the broader picture how can we make the community better what can we do for the people in the community mm -hmm. that may have tied back to, but I think it had to do with his whole interest. He was so obviously very pious in his beliefs and he really mm -hmm. felt that he was doing God's work and he was working within that and his religion buoyed up everything he did and supported what he did. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and, and you mentioned, Bill, um, I mean, obviously we've been talking about family, but you also um, touched upon the fact that his family did a lot of the work in kind of, you know, preserving his legacy. Uh, so could you talk a little bit more about that and, you know, how his family have contributed to his sort of enduring legacy, maybe preserving documents that are relevant to this story? I would hope that would be the case. I can honestly tell you the family was not interested in the book. I don't mm -hmm. know why. I've since been told they were very happy with it, but oh. I tried, I talked to his uh, elder sister, Joanne. Unfortunately, she said, we just don't want to be involved. And because of that, I did not have access to the family material. They had enough to do a web page. I you can look it up, and mm -hmm. so on. Uh, that that yes, but that's that's it. That's the only contact I had with them. I felt really disappointed. I really felt that we could have gotten more anecdotes, even answering the question about the breakup of the family and how that mm -hmm. affected him and things. I just had no access to it whatsoever. We tried through several avenues, including friends of theirs, to see if mm -hmm. they would change their minds, and the answer was no. Okay, that's very interesting. Um, and so um, I can't see any other questions, but I just wanted to invite you to, um, you know, maybe there's an aspect of the talk that perhaps you didn't get to go into as much detail with. Maybe there's a, a particular area of this study or, or this research that, you know, particularly fascinated you. Um, I was just wondering if there was anything else you'd like to, to pick up and develop on uh, before we finish up here. Okay. I think for me, the biggest thing was the origin of racism. Because we, we tend to think of, well, people, we see people are different, therefore there must have been racism previously. Mm -hmm. And when I started looking into it, particularly as a religious historian, you're aware of cultures other, you know, ancient cultures, the Sumerians, mm -hmm. the Babylonians and the like. And you start looking for evidence of racism where they did things. And what you find is that doesn't exist. The Egyptians, for example, called the people coming from the Middle East into their land sand ramblers. That is, mm -hmm. they weren't as on the level, but that wasn't racism. That's economic prejudice, but it's not racism. You don't find any of that in any of these cultures. And it became to me, somewhat startling to say, wait a minute, where does this come from? And the mm -hmm. sad part is not only does it start in this country, we've exported it worldwide. You know, racism now is, is integrated. Uh, in Bangladesh, for example, when the East Pakistanis were fighting against the West Pakistanis, one of the fights were the East Pakistanis were darker than the, the lighter mm -hmm. Pakistanis in the West, and yet they're the same country. Mm -hmm. um, th that sort of thing. And we see it all the time. We see it in Africa now where the darker tribes are considered not as good as the lighter tribes in some of the fighting that took place. And it's really oh. sad that we have been in the process of doing that. And I, I don't know how we get past this because we're mm -hmm. seeing it playing out right now on TV and so on where the racism is, is constant, even mm -hmm. though we had been making progress. Back in the 60s, you never saw a black actor 
male or female in commercials. Extraordinarily mm. rare. Now it's commonplace and so on. And my wife teaches college students. And one of the topics they do is uh, Florida literature. And what they're talking about in one case was racism. The kids didn't have any race. They didn't have any concerns whatsoever. It was their parents, their grandparents, mm. the ones who are in political power. Mm. So maybe we're getting past it, but we're right now going through this terrible situation that's happening. We're seeing it played out. And I think that's what makes a books like this seemingly more important that people can understand what people had to go through even to get things better than they were before. Mm. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Bill. Um, and, you know, I, I appreciate the work you've done to, um, you know, historicize present issues that we're dealing with and to, to give us a sense of some of those uh, historical legacies um, from issues ranging all the way from early settlement in Virginia up to the present day. Um, it's, it's very difficult to study the, these things in isolation and we always have to be aware of those broader arcs. Um, and of course, this is a story that um, many people may not have heard of, as you have, have already mentioned, in, in just in terms of, you know, this was a, a local campaigner, someone who was working on the ground and incredibly dedicated in that work. So we appreciate you being able to shed some light on that story and to bring it to our listeners here tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate it, Bill. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. And we look forward to seeing you at our next lecture, which, as I said earlier, will be March 16th at noon for J. Brent Morris's uh, History of the Dismal Swamp. Thank you and good night. <laughs>